Good afternoon and welcome to this special presentation of the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I extend a warm welcome to you all here in the audience and the thousands of you who are joining us on our online webcast. The Voices in Leadership series are part of our school's leadership education programs, offering an opportunity for students and faculty to hear from high profile leaders in a variety of areas and to learn from their experience as they reflect on leadership and their careers. We have been fortunate to welcome ministers of health, leaders of international non-governmental organizations, US officials, and members of international parliaments. These broadcasts are posted online after each event and can be viewed on demand at your convenience. I encourage you to visit the link at hsph.harvard.edu backslash voices to view any and all of the sessions. Dynamic, persuasive, and brilliant, best describes today's speaker, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Senator Warren is the senior senator for Massachusetts and is recognized as one of the nation's top experts on bankruptcy law and the financial pressures facing middle-class families. She's widely credited for the original thinking, political courage, and relentless persistence that led to the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. In the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, Senator Warren served as chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel for the Troubled Assets Relief Program, or TARP, earning support from both sides of the aisle. Senator Warren has also recently joined the pantheon of comic book heroes <laughs> with the release uh, earlier this week of a book about her in the series Female Force, a series designed to help empower girls and women. Prior to that, Senator Warren was a law professor for more than 30 years, <laughs> including 20 years as the Leo Gottlieb Professor of Law at our Harvard Law School. She has written more than 100 articles and 10 books, including three national bestsellers. Senator Warren is a graduate of the University of Texas with a Bachelor of Science degree in Speech Pathology and Audiology from 1970 and a JD degree from Rutgers University in 1976. Before Senator Warren comes to the podium to give opening remarks, I'd like to also welcome Dr. Michelle Williams, Chair of our Department of Epidemiology and the Dean-Designate at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Michelle is known around the world for her influential studies on maternal and child health, and I look forward to passing the Dean's baton to Michelle uh, in this summer, and I know she'll take the, the school to even greater heights. After Senator Warren's introductory remarks, she and Dr. Williams will go to the stage to begin the interview, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Senator Elizabeth Warren. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. So it feels great to be back in a classroom. Uh, although I do have to say, uh, uh, they didn't used to applaud. Uh, so this really makes it, makes it specially nice. So thank you very much for the warm introduction. I'm looking forward to our conversation, Michelle. I thought what I would do today is I would, instead of having a prepared speech for you, I would try to tell three leadership stories that are personal stories. I'll try to tell them as briefly as I can, but I always get wound up in all the details. Um, and then I would tell you at least three lessons that I take from those three stories, and maybe that'll give us a launching place for our subsequent conversation. So the first one I want to start out with is the term medical bankruptcy. And I want to tell you a little bit about the story behind it. How many of you have heard of the term medical bankruptcy? People talk about medical, like, good, we got a lot of people in here, okay, who know about this. Um, I started doing work on bankruptcy on families that go broke. My training is in law. Uh, and I teamed up with a sociologist originally, another law professor, a sociologist, and we started doing empirical studies on families who go broke. This actually started back in the 80s, when in law schools, nobody was doing empirical studies. The only smart things that happened were things you could generate entirely out of your own brain. Uh, and so nobody was collecting data. We started collecting data about families that were going broke, and there was a clear narrative at the time we started our work. And that was the people in bankruptcy were of two kinds. They were either people who were just part of the marginal economy, day laborers, housemates, people who would just never be able to piece together enough to have stable economic lives, or they were people who had badly, badly, badly misbehaved. 
uh, people who had run up lots of gambling debts, for example. So our studies were starting to show, wait a minute, the people who are filing for bankruptcy actually don't look like that, notwithstanding the fact that this is what the testimony in Washington looked like, and this was kind of the, the dominant discussion about people. And so we started looking at trying to, to unravel why families were going bankrupt. And here's where the story intersects with the Harvard School of Public Health. And that is, I had been interviewed for uh, uh, an article, and one of the things I mentioned in the article is not quite sure about the intersection with medical debt and bankruptcy. And Steffi Woolhandler and uh, uh, David Himmelstein, who were then at the Harvard School of Public Health, called me and said, we saw your, this, this article in the newspaper, can we come over and talk? And the more we talked, they saw what was happening from a public health point of view, I saw what was happening from a legal point of view, uh, meeting in the bankruptcy courts, we designed a whole new series of studies that ultimately revealed two very important things. That the overwhelming proportion of those who file for bankruptcy, when measured not by current income, because many, many were out of work, but when measured by kind of long-term measures, like their education, their occupational prestige scores, home ownership rates, were pretty solidly middle class. And secondly, that about half of them were filing for bankruptcy in the aftermath of a serious medical problem that had just caused financial devastation. And hence, the first article we did around this became an article about something called medical bankruptcy. And then I'll link it to where that ended up going. Medical bankruptcy became part of what then candidate Obama talked about in 2008. And then, when candidate Warren was running for the United States Senate in 2012, Barbara Mikulski, senior senator from Maryland, shows up, stands on the stage with me, and starts talking about the debates over the Affordable Care Act and the conversations that are going on in the senator's offices about this. And she said someone had given her an article that suggested it was not just enough to have insurance coverage but that the quality of insurance coverage really mattered. And that in fact, many of the people, she's now quoting, who were people identified as having medical bankruptcies, that about three quarters of them had, had health insurance at the onset of the illness or accident that ultimately bankrupted them. Uh, they either lost it when they got sick or it was lousy insurance to begin with. That is, they outran caps, you know, $5,000 cap doesn't do you, doesn't get you where you need to be if you have something like a cancer that's very expensive to treat. So anyway, she said, so we looked at this article, she said, I've still got my copy with all yellow underlining in it, and she said, and that's when we decided to do things like put a ban on capping repayment for serious medical conditions on health insurance. So you watch something that didn't exist that was, and then becomes academics talking about it, doing research, all the way through to something that made its way into law. So that was story one. You can applaud at this point. <laughs> right, you don't have to. I was just kidding. I was just kidding. I just like, it's hard for me to see everybody's face, so I like to hear that you're out there. Okay. So that's story one that I want to tell. Story two that I want to tell is, and I'll try to tell this as fast as I can, but this, boy, this is a story. Um, Huh. Consumer credit. So there have been three periods in history of consumer credit. The first one goes from the Code of Hammurabi uh, to 1980. <laughs> and that's the period in which the first consumer protection law is, is dominant in the world, and that is usury laws. You can only charge so much interest. For a whole bunch of complicated legal reasons, 1979, 1980, that effectively is repealed. And so we end up in a world where there are no usury laws, and it takes a few clicks for the credit industry to begin to figure out the implication of that. But before long, we have credit cards that go from being a page and a half long to being 35 pages long with lots of complicated legalese and lots of really high interest rates and tricks and traps and surprise fees and so on and so forth. And then other creditors who look over and see what's happening in the credit card industry and say, we'd like a piece of that action. And so we end up with things like teaser rate mortgages 
and a whole lot of just really awful credit products out there. Well, the Taser Rate mortgages got us into a big subprime mortgage bubble. Um, ultimately, um, the economy crashed. There's just no other way to say what happens in 2008, and a big part of why it crashed is because there were too few restrictions on consumer lending that kept the playing field level. Too, too little that said you've got to be, you know, you've got to kind of reveal the basic facts about what this transaction is all about. And so I had an idea on what to do about this. I said, you know, it's not that we need more law. The problem we've got is a structural problem. There are bits and pieces of federal consumer protection law, but some is at the OCC and some's at the Fed and some is at the FTC and some is the, at the FDIC. How many initials can you put together here in saying this? But the problem was it was nobody's first responsibility. The Fed was doing monetary policy, which is very cool, right? And FDIC was worried about the profitability of the banks, which I get. Nobody was watching out for the consumers first. So I said, let's take all of those, put them together, all of these laws, and let's make one new agency that has both the tools and the responsibility to get a level playing field for consumers so that consumers will really have a chance to buy a mortgage, to take out a credit card, to, to be able to have a bank loan, and not just be at the mercy of the lender on the other side. So the financial markets crash. Uh, this is a moment when we're writing what becomes Dodd-Frank, everybody in Washington. I'm, a, I'm an academic. I have no political role at this point. So I start going to Washington to talk to people about this idea for this agency. And I mean, it is literally, it's me. I got one guy who, who is able to help out part time, right? And I go in when I can get an opportunity and talk to congressmen and talk to senators and talk to their staffers. I'll talk to anybody who'll talk to me. And, uh, uh, and I pitched this idea. Now, you wouldn't be surprised. I really start out pretty much with our friends, because those are the places I can get in the door first. And I tell them about this idea, about what's happened, why we've had the big crash in 2008. And here's a way we can, we can help American consumers. We can help the economy, and we can avoid this kind of crash in the future. And so people said to me, these, these very experienced politicians said two things to me. The first thing they said to me is, that's a good idea. That, that actually is an idea that could make a real difference. And then the second thing they said to me is, don't do it. And the reason they said don't do it is they said, you can never win. You, you will totally lose. You will be up against the largest lobbying force assembled on the face of God's green earth. The banks will fight this because it will cost them money. And the banks will fight this tooth and nail, and you will win, and uh, you will lose. And when you lose, you will walk away with nothing. So don't do this. And so I hear this, and I think what they're saying to me is, try harder. <laughs> you know, it's kind of the Nancy Drew intrepid policymaker <laughs> school. I just couldn't hear it. That's what I thought they were saying to me. And, so I thought, great, I'll try harder, you bet. How am I going to try harder here? So I thought, oh, I know how I'm going to do this. I'm going to get people together. I'm going to do a conference call. So the first conference call on this consumer agency, I think had three people on it, which I think legally does not qualify as a conference call. <laughs> Nonetheless, three became six, six become 10, 10 become 20. And then a very dear friend said, uh, you're going to have a hard time doing this person by person. How about organizing group by group? And I started finding groups, none of which had consumer credit as their first issue, but it was somewhere in there. So I always say on this story, God bless the AFL-CIO. They said, this affects our members. We'll step up and we'll help you on this. Uh, God bless AARP. They said, this affects our members. We will step up and help you. Consumers Union, you think about toasters and dishwashers, they said, we also care about mortgages and credit cards. Uh, we will be part of this. And eventually, we got more than 100 groups together, which meant we had lots of people linked up by email. And when the day came to fight over this consumer agency, the senators and representatives I talked to earlier had been right. The banks hated the idea. 
They were spending more than a million dollars a day lobbying against financial reforms, and this was the center of the target. They announced repeatedly, there will be no financial reforms unless the agency dies. We will kill this agency. Well, all I can say is, we all fought back, and we got that agency, and we got it passed into law. And that's today's Consumer Financial Protection Bill. Oh, I love that. It, but just to, just to help you all here, before you leave and say, I cannot believe that I sat there and applauded for the creation of a new federal agency. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Uh, uh, you're not turning into a total nerd. There is a reason to applaud. That little agency has been up and running now for four years. It has forced the largest financial institutions in this country to return more than $16 billion to people that they have cheated. It has managed about 800,000 complaints, people who otherwise had no place to go to try to get some redress. And all I can say is, for me, it is the living proof that we can make government work for the people. So that one really matters a lot. <laughs> so the last one I'll tell, I'll try to tell quickly, and that is, um, what it's like to be in the United States Senate and to have an issue that you really, 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 really care about. So uh, I never thought I'd be running for Senate, which means I hadn't, I, I kind of had to figure this out once I got there, what, what exactly I was going to do. And I thought, you know, there are things you'll do because they just come to you, because you have to. But there need to be places, this is my chance, oh, sorry about that, this is my chance to push on the things I really care about. And one of them is funding for research. Uh, uh, NIH research, uh, NSF research. Uh, I may be the only senator, a sitting senator, or maybe senator ever, who actually was funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, go NSF. Uh, <laughs> but I really care about this. And I care about this for a couple of reasons. And I particularly focus on NIH. I care about it because NIH is getting a lot less money than it used to get. So uh, Senate did a, and the uh, Congress did a big deal uh, in 2003, was the last year of doing it. They actually doubled funding for NIH. Nobody said, woohoo, we've done what we should do. The reality is, if we just stayed on the projected growth and done the adjustments for biomedical inflation, today there would be about 20% more money at the NIH than there is. And even at 20%, we need more than that. And the reason we need more than that is because we're turning down good research in this country. There's a lot of good research we're not doing. Uh, nine out of 11 finalists for NIH funding today do not get funded by NIH. And the reason is not because they're not good proposals. Those are the finalists. It's because there simply is not enough money. And we can make the pitch about the implications of that in two different ways. One is we could just do it straightforward on money. Uh, this year, the Alzheimer's Association, I'll just pick one, estimates that we will spend about $226 billion caring for people with Alzheimer's. And we can offer them by way of treatment nothing. We have no way to delay the onset, to help people recover. We have nothing to offer. So how much is NIH spending on Alzheimer's research? The answer is less than two-tenths of 1% of that amount. So you can look at it either way. Um, there's a disease that, by the way, with an aging population, is continuing to affect a larger and larger proportion of our population than ever before. It is costing us hundreds of billions of dollars now and it will not be long before it crosses the threshold into a trillion dollars. Um, the finances are unbelievable in this area, but it's also the number of people's lives that are robbed. Um, people, people who are lost, lost to themselves and lost to their families. So I think it really matters. I think that funding NIH is one of the best things the government does. It is the investment in the future. It is the investment in making a better world for our people and for people all around the country, so, around the world. So 
So here's the question. How do you go about doing something like that in the United States Senate? I'll tell just a little part of this story. The first part is I figured I need to get on the right committee because a lot of work in the Senate is done by committees. So right after I'm elected, the leader of the Senate, uh, Harry Reid, calls me in and he says, we're going to put you on banking, which makes sense. I totally get that. There have been a lot of speculation in the press. And I said, that's great. I really appreciate it, Mr. Leader. But I want to be on health, education, labor, and pensions as well. And uh, he looks at me and says, oh, no freshman gets two A-list committees. And I said, oh, well, <clears throat> let me tell you why I should get two A-list committees. <laughs> And so he listened politely for 10, 15 seconds, and he said, no freshman gets two A-list committees, and showed me out of his office. So I left his office, and I thought, hmm, mm, didn't have the right argument. OK. So I had try harder. So I, call, so I call him back a couple of days later. I come back to Boston. I call him back a couple of days later. I said, Mr. Leader, I said, um, about my committees, uh, this, I get all the reasons I should be on banking, and I want to be on banking. But let me explain to you why it's really important for me to be on health. Blah, 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 blah. And he says, no freshman gets to a list committees. And he hangs up. <laughs> and now it turns out Harry actually does that to everybody. He just hangs up when he's through talking. So, so I didn't know this at this point. I was like, ooh. And I thought, OK, so I need another argument. <laughs> So about three days later, I called him back, and I said, <clears throat> Mr. Leader, I said, I understand about the, but, but let me tell you why I need to be on help. So I gave him my argument, and he says, no freshman gets two A-list committees, bang. And so I thought, well, all right, all right, right. So we get down. This happens repeatedly. We don't have to <laughs> count how often. Uh, and we get down. It's it, the, the, it's, it's now in the press that it's going to be, committee assignments will be announced the next day. And so I know once it's made public, I mean, that's it, the game's over. So I call his office, I place the call to his office one more time, and his assistant picks up, and she says, yes, I'll, I'll put you through. Leader Reed picks up the phone and says, no freshman gets two A-list committees. And I said, I know, but listen to one more argument. I made the argument, all I can say is, I got two A-list committees. I'm on help. Yes. So, so it's been a place from which I have now spent three years arguing for more funding for NIH. We've gotten some more funding. We're at $1.7 billion more a year now. That's not nearly enough. We're in the middle of a big fight, which if I get a chance, Michelle and I can talk a little bit about it. But pushing toward more funding for NIH. So I just want to say three things about that I take away from this. One is the importance of persistence. I, I am nothing if not persistent. Uh, it is hard to insult me. Uh, I just, because I believe in persistence. I believe that persistence is a huge part of what leadership is about. Um, the second part is a willingness to fight. And that means a willingness to take some hits sometimes, and not just Fold your tents over it. Uh, certainly had to do it over the CFPB. We got into the fights over medical bankruptcy. The insurance industry hired someone to try to take us out over that. I've certainly been in them over NIH, and particularly over how to get the money for NIH funding. You just got to be willing to do that. If you think the path of leadership is one that everyone will acknowledge, oh, that's the right idea, and, and keep you going. It's not. A big part of leadership is the willingness to fight for what you believe in. And the third lesson I take away from that is that no one makes change by themselves. Nobody. Uh, every one of these stories is replete with allies, people who were not allies but who became allies, people who get invested in your work. I never would have done the medical bankruptcy work if Steffi and David hadn't come at it from another angle and said, here's another way I think you could look at, at every part of how you did this. We never could have done the CFPB if it hadn't been for SEIU and AFL and AARP and all the groups that said, we'll put some of our energy behind this. And a big part of what we're trying to do now with funding on NIH is gathering up allies from both sides of the aisle to say, we are going to be persistent. We are willing to fight. 
but we are going to work together and we're going to make some real change. So that's it for me on leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You ready, Michelle? All right. Well, I think we've all heard this afternoon that the best way to get Senator Warren to keep moving forward is to say no. <laughs> um, and your three summary lessons, uh, persistence, um, commitment, even if it means taking some hits in the fight, and then your third one, that it's a team sport. Mm -hmm. Leadership is indeed a team sport. And I think we here at the Chan School of Public Health recognize that. And I think our voices in leadership is a perfect example of our recognizing that um, public health requires teamwork, working across disciplines. And your, all three of your stories illustrate the importance of the teamwork that's necessary Good. in and your that tenacity. Was not <laughs> that's right. So um, your three stories brought to mind for me um, wanting to know a little bit about um, your, your career trajectory, starting out there. You grew up in Oklahoma City as the fourth um, child, youngest child in a family, um, working class parents. Only girl. And the only girl, that's right, four, three older brothers. Mm -hmm. Could you They're tell all. us a little bit about your background and what brought you to this point in your career? Uh, so, uh, I, I, I was the baby by a lot. Uh, uh, my brothers were 8 and 12 and 16 when I was born. Uh, my mother was uh, nearly 40, which in those days, you didn't have so many mamas at that age. And they used to refer to me as the surprise. <laughs> I was about 30 before it hit me what that probably meant. <laughs> but um, uh, I lived in a family, like a lot of families, that had a lot of economic ups and downs. Uh, uh, for us, one of the pivotal moments, I was 12 when my father had a, a heart attack. And it just, it turned our family upside down, financially uh, and emotionally. Uh, my mother had been a stay-at-home mom. Uh, it, 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 we lost the family station wagon. Uh, we were on the edge of losing our home. The bills had piled up. My dad's out of work. Uh, and I remember when my mother uh, put on her high heels, put on her best dress, and walked over to the Sears and got a minimum wage job. And it was a minimum wage job that not only saved our home, it saved our family. And it, it was, there was no money for college. I had a scholarship in debate, uh, and... <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> uh, but then I got married. I got married at 19. I was so smart. Uh, <laughs> to my first husband. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I wasn't going to get to finish college, you know, no part of it. And I ended up, in fact, I should do just a small correction. I, I, I actually didn't graduate from the University of, of Texas. I graduated from the University of Houston, which is a commuter college, or it was back then, uh, a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it opened a million doors for me. Um, I ended up, I, I taught special needs kids. That's what drove me. I really, really, really wanted to be a school teacher. And that meant I had to get a college diploma. It was not like you get a college diploma because everybody gets a college diploma. It's no, it was the ticket to be able to be a teacher. And, um, uh, and then when my first baby was born, um, that was the end of teaching in those days. And uh, so I was at home. I ended up going to law school, to a public law school. Uh, I think that one cost about about four hundred and fifty dollars a semester. That's. I grew up in an America that was investing in public education for our kids. I grew up in an America that believed that investing in young people getting an education is investing in all of us, and that's how it worked for me. So I practiced law out of my living room for a while. I ended up, I had another baby. I had baby laws in law school. I got divorced. I mean, it's all those pieces. And then I became a law professor and started studying 
other families that went broke. And it was the, I think I started studying bankruptcy because my family had never, we never declared bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. We've been in a lot of trouble, but never declared bankruptcy. And I thought, yeah, I'm gonna study those guys because those are the people who didn't work as hard as we did. Or so there's gonna be some difference between us. And what I saw is, no, they look like us. They look like, they look like our neighbors, they look like our families. Just, but just one thing lined up a little bit differently and they ended up with a longer period of unemployment, with more medical debt, with, with couldn't get that minimum wage job even. And so that became the heart of my life's work. And then you hurt much of the rest of it right yeah. there. No, thank you for that. You're thank welcome. you for that. That's it. I, um, I, our students, um, prior to our session, offered some questions around general leadership. And I, I thought I'd start with a few of these. There were an incredible number of questions, and we've tried to narrow them down across categories. And the first question is around general leadership. And I think this one um, um, riffs a little bit from your three stories. And the question is, what do you consider some of the most challenging aspects of leadership in this 21st century? So I think the, the most challenging, at least in the space that I work in, is how much there is to be done and how much the problems all intersect with each other. It's not like you can solve one thing and then say, we will have fixed it all. It's that it's they all intersect. And the, the consequence of that is it's a constant battle in your head, or at least it is for me, between I gotta stay on this thing I'm working on or we'll never drive it through and make it happen, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, versus but there's a window of opportunity over here, and maybe if we reach out and pull in two more people, we can get a little twist in it. We got $1.9 billion, right, into, into additional NIH money, where, where you can make those differences. And it's, it's that you've got the overall sense of where you want to drive it, but there are so many paths, opportunities, rocks along those paths, so it's a constant set of judgment calls. On, on how to get there, and it's always for where you can make a difference, where you can make a difference. Show me a place where I can move it one degree, because if I can move it one degree, then I'll find another place where I can move it one more, and I can move it one more, and one more after that, and after a while, you've really started to make a difference that has an impact. Related to that, um, how do you as a leader relate to this issue of legitimacy issue, that you weren't in on this big pathway in the beginning, or um, you're not from here, right. so you really can't know the situation. Um, how, how do you deal with that as a leader? Because it is part of coalition building. Yeah. It can get in the way of coalition building and, and moving that primary agenda along. I think, it's, I think it's the starting place is around asking people then, well, it, so if I explain this more to me then, mm -hmm. just that's fine. You, Think I'm not here, I don't have to say one way or the other. It's to say, so tell me what I need to know. Tell me what I should hear. Tell me what part I'm missing on this. Let people, let people talk and look, dang, sometimes you learn things when you, when you listen instead of speak. And then go for it, right? And that's the other half. This goes back to, to one of the lessons I was talking about. Listen. And I'm glad to listen, I'm glad to bring in as many people as I can, but at the end of the day, never forget, I am gonna drive this bus as far and as hard and as fast as I can in the direction I think I should go. Now, I'll keep the door open for a while, I'll try to get as many people on board, but at the end of the day, you are not gonna stop me. So, come with me or stay behind, but we are going. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. In your three stories, you, you mentioned um, in passing the Medical in Innovation Act, mm -hmm. which would have put us today in a better position than where we are. Uh, and we're a school where 67% of our research is sponsored research is from NIH. And so we feel the pain uh, uh -huh. from the eroding NIH funding. Yeah. Um, and you've been um, 
you, your other story talked about the Affordable Care Act, and I know that you've been deeply involved in the clean water action. Mm -hmm. You have been a champion for the middle class, but also a champion for public health because they're inseparable. Well, they're inseparable. They're inseparable. That's right. So the question is, what in, uh, what is, in your opinion, the most pressing public health issue today, and what steps would need to be taken to address it? And I think you've somewhat addressed it in the importance of um, sustaining the, in, the engine of innovation and discovery in our NIH funding. But perhaps you can elaborate and expand on that. Actually, so because I've said that part, let me do it as two parts, because I think this is really right. The first part is the innovation engine, and that's, that's what this work is about. This is why we need to fund NIH. And when I say innovation, I mean it all across the board. I use the example of Alzheimer's because it's easy to latch onto, but it's also better understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, of the behavioral sciences, uh, uh, why we're seeing certain kinds of health problems and not other health problems, the whole delivery system, everything around this. The innovations there. But the other half, I, I think the single biggest health, public health problem is poverty. It just is. And it's, it, it's, it's not that we don't know what to do. We know the importance of maternal health, right? We know the importance of babies being well nourished. We know the importance of little children having plenty of stimulation and things to play with and hearing lots of vocabulary. We, we don't, I'm, I'm glad to do more research in these areas about good ways to do it, but the reality is there's a whole bunch we know that we just flat are not doing. And this one matters so much because, again, it is so connected to everything. It is connected to housing. It is connected to jobs. It is connected to a robust economy. It is connected to education. It is connected to a system that is open. When I talk about America's middle class, the whole point is that a growing, expanding middle class is creating spaces in it. It's creating spaces for people who are poor to actually see there's a place I could go. There's there's somebody who needs me. There's, there's, there's a job for me. There's an opening for me. There's an opportunity for me where I will have a chance to build some real security for myself and for the people I love. And, and I just feel like public health, that's the heart of what it's all about. That's, it, it, I can't tell you where public health stops and housing starts. It all fits together. And this goes back to, you were asking me the, the leadership challenge. The bad news is we need to make changes on a thousand different fronts on poverty. You know, Lyndon Johnson, when he declared the war on poverty, God bless him, a heart that was in the right place, but boy, did we miss things we needed to do and not deliver on things we needed to do. So I guess you could look at it the other way and say there's a lot of opportunity out there for the work that all of us need to engage in and make the changes for our country. It is, it is the right thing to do economically, but it is the right thing to do morally. The next set of questions are related to careers in public service. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of our students asked, what advice would you give to someone who's really passionate about serving in government to radically and positively change our healthcare system? What steps would you begin to take? So on an individual basis, the best thing I can tell you to do is reach outside from your own sphere of expertise. Get to know people who are different from you. And when I say different from you, I mean who work in different ways, who are economists, who are statisticians, who are um, uh, sociologists, uh, although they may not be so far away from where you are. But, but the point is, get to know them and get to know people who are already in public service. Um, because, and here's why I think this is so, it will change your vocabulary. It will change how you frame a problem. It will take the part that's the core that you know and the passion you've got around it, and help other people understand it better. It's, it's the core of what teachers do, but it's the core of what anybody who wants to make a change has to be able to do. You cannot just talk to the experts in your field. You've got to be able to reach out and make those connections across so you can build the kind of coalition for change and so you can find those opportunities. Every one of mine, I didn't do the whole kind of path into public service, 
but every one of it. I didn't start out knowing there was going to, knowing there was going to be a financial crash, and then Congress was going to pass a law to have uh, the uh, congressional oversight panel. But boy, when I'm looking around and the door is there, and I see that door open, a crack in public service, you run as hard and fast as you can at it. Yeah. yeah? I remember you saying once uh, that um, law school opened a thousand doors for you. It's true. Um, and uh, I took from that uh, that it allowed you to engage so many other disciplines mm -hmm. in addressing the problems that you would face. It's true. So many disciplines, and more to the point, to learn from so many people and to take the bits and pieces of what you learn and say, wait a minute, it lines up. We can see how these pieces fit together. Now we can make a change. And it's not lost on me that you reached out to sociologists yeah. um, and public health um, practitioners. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Uh -huh. You bet. Um, so um, I'll go back to another question around negotiation compromise and, sure. partisan, um, and the partisan Congress. Um, and the question is, um, how do you balance compromising on policy issues uh, versus standing your ground on ideology in the face of a very partisan Congress? You know, I'm, uh, this is going to be one I'm going to have to reject the premise of the question, because I actually just don't see it that way. I know what I'm fighting for every single day, and I will look for any way I can to help get there. Now, what that sometimes means is it sometimes means, let's have a big throwdown fight over this. I am ready to have a big throwdown fight. I'm serious. Over Oklahoma City style. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Name your weapons. Uh, I'm ready to have a big throwdown fight over how we educate our young people. And I've picked higher ed because it's a, it's a place that nobody had been talking about very much. And the importance of being a country that invests in young people who are trying to get education after high school. I just think this is absolutely critical. And I will throw down with anybody over this. I throw down over NIH funding. Uh, that I talk to every one of the other senators uh, in, the, in Washington right now, and they all say, oh, yes, I love medical research. Oh, medical research is my friend. And then I say, well, good. Let's put some more money in medical research. And they say, well, <laughs> not actually more money, uh, because it has to come from someplace else. You've got to either stitch up a tax loophole or you've got to be willing to cut a military budget, or you've got to be willing to cut someplace else and identify where those cuts are. And everything's already got its own constituency to stay the way it is. So sometimes you just got to be willing to throw down. But it doesn't mean throwing down is the point. Right, right. So there are a lot of times you don't have to throw down over something. Uh, uh, Senator Langford, uh, uh, freshman senator, Republican, has the office next to mine. And uh, we got to talking about transparency is how the conversation started. And I started talking to him about the fact that these big banks and other big uh, uh, corporations break the law and then do a settlement with Department of Justice or somebody else. And they do these giant headlines, $50 billion, you know, $100 million, whatever it is. They do something and they do these big, big, and they all stand there and say, oh, now justice has been served. And you try to find out about the details of these settlements. Oh, it turns out mm, the company was getting credit for stuff they were going to do anyway. And uh, their penalty is tax deductible so that you're picking up you know, a third of it and this kind of stuff. And I said, I just think this stinks. I think that if the government is actually going to do a settlement with a big settlement, I get little tiny ones you don't bother with this, but with big settlements, something over you know, lots and lots of money, then I think it ought to be public. I think anybody in America ought to be able to read that. I think researchers then ought to be able to look at it and kind of get some data out of what's going on there, and others ought to be able to see it. And Langford and I don't agree on a lot of things, but he looked at that and said, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me. And by golly, we introduced a bill. It has passed the United States Senate, and right now is pending on the short list in the House of Representatives. We may get that dang thing signed into law. So it's not the the throw down by itself, it's knowing what your goals are and just trying to figure out what's the best way to get there. And sometimes, sometimes we get there because we find that little 
section in the Venn diagram where we can both agree and, and, and make that work. And sometimes we get there by saying, hey, look, it's time to get all of America involved in making one of those circles move over. And that was my best math analogy for the day. So <laughs> <laughs> then the Venn diagram is, yes, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. That's very good. OK. Well, I could see where the comic hero comes in. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I want that lasso of truth that Wonder Woman had, don't you? I'm going to put that around people. OK, um, so I am told that we have to wrap up. Oh, and it's, okay. it's unfortunate. Um, but I, I want to thank you so much uh, for choosing to spend your time with us this afternoon and to really speak um, so powerfully about leadership, but the core characteristics that make a leader. Um, and you embody that. And so thank you very much. It's a nice thing to say. But let me say. I'm delighted to be here, but most of all, I'm delighted to be here because I believe in what you're going to do. My job is just to do my best to create the opportunity for you to do the work that really is going to change the world. I believe in you, and that's why I'm here today. So get out there and change the world.